Let's welcome Georgios Papadopoulos, the CEO and founder of Atipon. And he will tell you what Atipon is, and he will tell you something about himself, I suspect, I hope, because there's almost nothing in his very discreet biography. So I know he's a very wonderful human being, but I only know him as a wonderful human being. He may have all sorts of, he may have a lot large conviction for all sorts of things in the past, which he hasn't told us about. Okay. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Uh, good morning, and thank you. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, I, and it's, it's a large crowd, so I'm, uh, I'm the nerd in this, so of course I'm going to talk about technology. Um, I didn't do very much in my life, frankly. After school, I worked very briefly, and then I started Atipon. So uh, for 22 years, I have been running Atipon. And Atipon started as a dream for creating a better technology company for scholarly communications. So what we perceived as you know, not a very strong technology from the various players that existed at the time, uh, we had a very strong focus on technology and enabling publishers to do more things with their websites. Um, Atipon has grown um, tremendously uh, in the years since it founded. Uh, it's, it's hosting about 40% of all scholarly uh, research content right now. Um, so you're interacting with some of our websites. And the reason for my presentation today is I'm going around trying to incite change on both of the publisher's side, uh, but also on the library side. We're sitting in a place as technology company, as a service, technology service company to the publishers, we're sitting at a place where we develop a lot of technology, but we cannot necessarily launch it until the publishers demand it. And in some cases, the publishers also uh, want to hear from, from the librarians that the librarians are ready to embrace this change. So there is an ecosystem and there is a whole community that needs to embrace some of these changes that I want to talk about uh, today. So uh, the clicker is, I guess, this. Which one is the clicker? <laughs> Sorry. Oh, is this the big green button, of course. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, <coughs> so um, I've been there since the beginning. So I've been there since the first journal that launched, um, and I was responsible for it. Um, and uh, so, you know, if somebody would actually, and the first two years were very exciting. We were doing a lot of different things. Uh, that was with Highwire at the time, um, and. Um, if somebody, however, would go into a long sleep uh, in 97 and wake up November 8th of 2017, um, he would see and would go and look at the websites. He would see pretty much the same things that uh, he saw uh, before he went to sleep. And what he would see was basically, is basically um, for institutional access, you would have IP authentication, pretty much, uh, username and password for your individual accounts uh, as a user, XML as the format uh, that, is, that the content is coming, uh, that's coming in, uh, a very dumb form of HTML and PDF, which are both pretty much dead uh, if, you look at, if you look at them, uh, for a reading experience. Um, the big search engines uh, for, you know, if you have any question that you want to ask across uh, different publisher sites. And of course, email alerts that you have to register on every publisher site uh, if you want to get any, uh, any alerts about what's new. And um, frankly, even in 97, there was some archiving going on and the same incomplete forms of archiving uh, that existed then pretty much exist now. There's not too much change. It's, which is interesting, in technology, for 20 years, we've been doing pretty much the same thing, over and over. And I can tell you, Adipon is like 350 people, most of them engineers, and we're doing pretty much the same thing. And the same thing happens all around the industry. 
Why do we need change? Okay, maybe, maybe what we're doing actually works. What, you know, what's, who said that we should be doing any change? Well, you know, I tried to list a number of reasons. I can list, you know, a hundred more reasons, frankly. Um, but some of the reasons, you know, some of the topics that I've put here is touch on the topics that I'm, uh, some of the questions that I put here, uh, reasons I put here, touch on the topics that I want to talk about. Um, institutional authentication and PDF drive content piracy. Uh, Sci-Hub, Libgen, all of the other forms. And you might, you know, you might have your own views on piracy. Um, I think that actually it has helped technology companies uh, as well. But at the end of the day, it puts, uh, it actually threatens the fundamentals of scholarly communications. Without rules, there is no game. So, um, then, of course, we have user frustration with uh, the various authentications that they have to do over uh, various websites. Uh, personalization is good. You know, everybody should have, you know, uh, every site should have personalization. The problem is that, you know, it becomes a nightmare for the users. Um, and um, the, you know, I call them archaic formats, HTML and PDF. Uh, basically is what we had 22 years ago, 20 years ago. Um, basically, they just mimic the print. That's what we do. Uh, we don't really learn much about it. Although in the in current world, we see, uh, we, we want more digital interaction. These forms, uh, these formats don't, uh, don't support digital interaction at all. Uh, search engines, you know, discovery done through search engines. Uh, and search engines are good if you know what you're looking for. They're not good if you just want to manage the new information coming in. Um, getting 100 emails per week uh, is no way, uh, that is not, it's not so manageable. Uh, and of course, as I say, archiving that is increasingly missing more and more content because more and more content in our websites, I can tell you, is not the content that it used to be 20 years ago. In the 20 years ago, we were just receiving the articles. Now, you're receiving all this other content around the articles, editorial content, that is actually not archived anywhere. So all of this is actually lost. At least, you know, it, it is kept by the website somehow, but a lot of it is actually going to be lost eventually. So we need to do something about it, okay? Then there is other things like annotations that the users are putting in and that is also going to be lost because that is also content in many cases. So we're, we're increasingly seeing user-generated content, editorial content, all kinds of content that is actually not archived anyway. So let me talk a little bit about the changes that are coming and where, you know, and, and how they're actually relating to the libraries. Uh, there is a big initiative uh, called RA21. Uh, it's a joint uh, STM and um, uh, NISO initiative uh, with publishers, technology companies, uh, and libraries, as a matter of fact, that are trying to change the way um, libraries access, uh, library, library patrons access uh, content that they have access to. Uh, we've known the problems, we know that it's, it's not convenient, uh, we know that it's not, uh, it's, you know, it actually enables uh, content pri uh, piracy, and we can really have the holy grail here, we really can, and we've proven it with some of the prototypes that are going on, that you can have both uh, seamless, very convenient access, preserve actually uh, individual privacy, uh, which is very important, and prevent content piracy. So uh, this is something that needs to be embraced by the libraries as well, because there are some changes that need to happen. And we think that this is going to be rolling out in 2018 and 2019. So um, you, know, you get some, uh, some information uh, on this one. Now, it's very interesting to me. The other, the other one is very interesting the, with the individual user authentication. There are so many. Uh, social, academic social networks, 
any one of these could become essentially the SSO for users to, you know, to uh, access in only, you know, have a password only in one place. None of them are vying for this uh, position, interestingly enough. You know, nobody wants to do it. It's a problem that needs to be solved. Any of them can solve it. I would invite them to solve it. Uh, that's something that maybe you should press on. Uh, content formats, I call them dinosaurs, digital in name only. Um, so it's a bunch of compromises the way they are today. Uh, you either have something that is portable, like the PDF, um, and immersive, um, or you have uh, something that is actually a little more dynamic, has a little more interaction, that is HTML. Uh, you either have something that is, uh, you know, uh, adapting to the device like the HTML, the PDF, it's very hard to read on a phone, you know, um, or, you know, you have the PDF, basically. Uh, the data right now is all linearized into pictures, you know, which is what we were doing for print. So you will not perhaps understand the difference unless you're showing, you're showing the actual data. But um, when we were printing articles, we're taking the, res the, the researchers had to take the results, create a chart, uh, take an image of that chart, and send it with their submission. We do exactly the same thing now. Although clearly, the researcher could just give the data they could say, this is the way to create a chart out of the data, and the chart can actually be created there, right there. And if I want to change the chart, because I want to see a different kind of chart, I can, as a user. That's what I want to achieve. The data usually is stored somewhere else. It's somebody else's uh, problem. You know, these linkages, who knows whether they're going to be preserved, or the data is going to be preserved, most likely that is also going to be lost. Just to give you, you know, I stole this reference actually from uh, the scholarly HTML uh, site. Uh, I think it's attributed to Sebastien Ballesteros. Um, basically, New York Times did, uh, did, a, uh, did uh, had a report. They did some changes to their websites, and they just added structured data. And they said just adding structured data, it increased our traffic to our recipes. They did it for their recipes. Uh, they increased their traffic to the re recipes uh, from search engines by 52%. So uh, as Ballester says, in other words, cupcake recipes are reaping greater benefits from modern data practices than the whole scientific endeavor. <laughs> and it's true. It's true. I mean, it's, it's sad, but it is true. Uh, this is the state of the art in uh, scholarly communications, uh, which is a shame, because <laughs> a lot of us are PhDs. We really care about the subject. Uh, we're really into it, not only as you know, people who are trying to do things, but also as readers. Uh, and um, for some reason, this you know, has, is, has become tough, difficult. Um, so. And, and, and part of the difficulty is, is, the, is, is the freedom of how do you do, what do you do with the formats. I mean, think about it. Science has the richest, you know, richest uh, content in terms of information. It's, it has the richest information. We can really uh, have a very rich information fabric on our articles. Um, yet, uh, nobody seems to be doing it. Um, where do we need to move? We need to move to scholarly HTML. Uh, when, and I'm not talking about moving to scholarly HTML just for reading. It's going to become the format, I believe, for authoring content as well. Because we really need to take the, the view that the content is going through several phases, and it's enriched in several phases, and we really need to keep it together. All this uh, you know, content being created in one format, transformed into XML, losing a lot of the original, uh, then trying to recreate from XML some delivery format, 
uh, losing a lot of the, you know, of the, of what's going on in between is just nuts. Um, so we're moving towards scholarly HTML, and of course, we need to, you know, the beauty of it is that it is immersive uh, if you do it in the right way. Uh, it adapts to the device. It allows annotations. That is user-generated interaction, user-generated content. It invites that. Um, we need to make it portable. And to make it portable, it means that we need to use EPUB. Very nice standard. So essentially, what I see is that uh, in the next year or two, and this is what we're working very actively on, everything goes into EPUB. Data, uh, EPUB with HTML. Uh, data remains in the document, okay, and is you know something that you can repurpose. The reader can actually view, for example, as I said, the results of the experiments uh, with different viewers uh, in different ways, in the ways that make sense for him, or download it right there. Uh, semantic overlays uh, will allow extensions uh, to the paper and add comprehension to it. And of course, machine learning. Machine learning, machine learning is the future of scholarly publishing. Uh, as we're trying to extract more and newer information and as we understand more ways in which we can extract the rich information that is in the papers. Discovery. Uh, it's good to have all of this information. How good it is is if we cannot actually find it, uh, or if it's so much of it that uh, we cannot actually uh, get to it. Uh, again, search engines are very good, excellent when you have something, you know, a specific question, and you have a way in which you can approach it. Then you kind of find somehow your information or parts of your information. Uh, however, researchers, um, what they need is actually to know is what is new. It's the fear of missing out. Uh, they need to know what is new uh, daily. And um, if you're a biomedical researcher, this is becoming just, as you know, impossible. I mean, there's probably, you have to read around 400 abstracts a day if you want to keep up with any, you know, slice of a domain. Um, so that's, that's becoming simply impossible. Uh, so getting emails from journals sent to you uh, is also uh, you know, not a good way of managing uh, your information, this, uh, this fire hose of information aimed at you. So robots. <laughs> um, paraphrasing the famous movie, one word, robots. Robots will help us. So um, yes, I know librarians will also help us, but um, you know, the, with thousands of papers a day, uh, it's becoming very difficult. I think librarians, the, the librarians will help us. It will help users in purposing their robots so that they can actually enhance uh, the discovery. So. What you see, what you will see is machine is tools actually, that uh, personalize tools that know the user, and they will bring from the websites uh, what is important for him. And ten min what ten is minutes, for Georgios. Him. So, and they will take into consideration everything that he's reading and his social networks, all of the information about his social networks. So, Going a little faster, archiving, current problems with archiving. Most, as I said, most um, archives, there are two kinds of archives. There's the archives that capture just the content, and they capture it in the XML or PDF form. And then there are archives that capture the site. Uh, as I say, the problems with, uh, con with, uh, with these, uh, the XML PDF, the static uh, archiving um, sites, is that they're increasingly missing out content and missing out user-generated content that is attached to the, to the actual uh, content. Uh, for example, annotations uh, and comments and so on and so forth by dis whole discussions. Um, and, um, and the uh, site archiving sites 
Well, they don't know what they're capturing, as a matter of fact, because they don't know when cha what changed, when it changed, or anything like that. So um, you have something like the Wayback Machine. I was looking at, you know, I said, just for the, you know, 10 years ago, go back to the Atipon site, look at, you know, let's look at some of the pages, and this is one of the pages that comes up. So something that they didn't capture. Archiving can actually be perfect, and I mean perfect. So I could, you could actually make it. Uh, if you remember, there was a problem some time ago, some years ago, that, well, even if we have the archives, we're not going to be able to read them because the tools that we used 10 or 20 or 50 years ago will not be possible, uh, will not be even available to install anywhere. That's not, no longer true. Technology has solved that problem. What we need to solve is the problem of archiving our websites. And the only way to archive the, the websites is actually from the CMS itself. Uh, so I haven't figured out the governance, what the governance needs to be. Technically, it is a difficult problem. I'm not going to say that it's not a difficult, it is an easy problem. But uh, the CMS itself, the content management system itself, knows where it changed, when it changed, and it can do perfect archiving. You can go to any date, and you will be able to see the website and interact with the website the way the user of that website would interact in that day. So, uh, in conclusion, basically, uh, technology has stayed the same for 20 years. Uh, let's make a pact that every 20 years will be changing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that it will keep our life also a little more interesting. Uh, and what we will need uh, is also uh, the help of librarians to push uh, sometimes the publishers to make some of these changes. Thank you very much. Georgios has very kindly offered to answer some questions, and I can see there are masses of questions on some of these extremely interesting points. I'm going to ask a question to start with, which is a question which I think people in the audience might like to ask, but probably won't. And that is, Georgios, what does your ongoing relationship with Wiley mean to what you're going to be doing in the future? Yeah. Um, well. Uh, why, the relationship with Wiley was actually good. First of all, Atipon operates as a totally independent company inside Wiley. Uh, nothing has changed, and Wiley doesn't have access to our systems either. Um, so the, the, the interesting part of with working with Wiley is that for the first time, I can actually see and talk to people inside the publisher in a different relationship. Okay, where they don't, they, they're not afraid that I am going to sell them something, but they're actually open to telling me about their problems and inviting them, inviting us to uh, try to figure out solutions. So it's actually a great thing. And Wiley, of course, is one of the publishers that also has a lot of access to librarians. So by that, I also get to speak with librarians and hear from both publishers and librarians about the different problems. In the old days, they would not come to really, you know, at that stage, they would have already figured out a solution, and then they would come to us and say, you know, build it. But now we are part of uh, actually developing the solution, of thinking about the solution, which is a great thing. Thank you very much. Uh, Carol, is there anything on the tweets that you would like to raise? He is coming. This is Carol Apollo. Twitter extraordinaire. There are just a number of questions about um, infrastructure and whether the in infrastructure can support uh, the changes. Yeah. Did you hear that? Yes. Infrastructure. Can, what in how is, can the infrastructure support the changes? Yes. Um, the te technology changes actually take a long time to develop. Technology solutions take a long time to develop. And we've been working on these things for a number of years. So the infrastructure is ready to start rolling out changes in 2018. 
uh, what I talked about, the content formats, uh, what I talked about, the um, discovery. All of these are actually poised, and the access, uh, access control, all of these are poised to be in 2018. Um, we've already, for example, in the case of, of access control authentication, um, we are running two pilots with universities, with university libraries. Um, one of them is run by Atipon, and the other one, uh, the other possible solution, I think, is by Elsevier. So they are just being verified, validated, and uh, to run out in 2018. Anthony. Thank you. Tina has a question. George, I have a stupid question, I'm sure. Um, Georgios, you've done a lot of talking about XML. What's going to happen to PDF? Or is anything going to happen to PDF? I think PDF, we should say good, goodbye to PDF. It doesn't, doesn't, it's not good format anymore, uh, as I see it. Um, it's very stuck. Very shocking <laughs> remark, if yeah. I may say so. <laughs> It's, uh, it doesn't, it, it's, it's non-interactive. Uh, it loses basically access to the original. You get a PDF, you download it, you store it. You never get what changes happened, whatever you know, comments, annotations happened there. Uh, it's not known to you. Uh, other changes that the publisher may have done to enhance the content are not known to you. So you just get a picture, essentially, of a document, you store it. This is not the document, okay? We need to get rid of that. I understand the nice thing about portability, but EPUB solves that problem. So we can solve, we can have both dynamically changing documents on our hard drives, <laughs> okay, with all the latest information um, and, you know, portability. No, the lady over there, could you give your name and affiliation, yeah. please? My name is Christine Stamison. I'm the director of the Northeast Research Libraries Consortium. Um, thank you very much for a um, very eye-opening presentation. Just a question. Um, you, you spoke about all this new technology in the background with publishers, RD21 and everything. So from a library's point of view, um, since I represent a whole consortium of libraries, is there something that they need to be investing in now technologically in order to become ready for this new technology? Uh, there, there, is, there is changes that they will need to apply to, uh, for the RA21. Um, I don't think that could, they will require any question. new capital. Uh, I think the basis is there. At least that's what we try to do with our solution. Uh, now, there is other things that you know, I, I, I missed in my presentation. Uh, for example, in case of the discovery, I know because we're developing one of these tools, uh, it's going to help institution repositories, for example. Uh, one of the problems that institution repositories have is uh, letting the people in their institution discover uh, the content that is there. It's a kind of, it's a chicken and egg problem. If, uh, if uh, the people don't discover it, then they are not encouraged to put it there. So we need to solve this uh, problem to dis uh, for, the, for, the, uh, for the members of the institution to discover the content of the institution. And a lot of the content of the, of the institution is content that is never going to be published anywhere. So it's very important that it actually is discovered. Uh, and I know that one of the solutions that we're bringing up actually allows the institutions to channel the discovery of this content to the institution members. Thank you very much. Yeah. Gentlemen here, and this is the last question. Oh, thank you, thank you. you. Uh, George, I'm Ken D. Fiori. I manage library relations at Portico. Yes. And um, I feel a little compelled because I, I, I took it that maybe um, you, you painted a, a bit of a, a doom and gloom picture. And I, I have to say that well, I, I think um, the, the work that, that, that we've done in the context of the current state of the, the publishing, uh, scholarly publishing workflow uh, it, 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 it is, it's been uh, uh, quite beneficial to libraries. So we, we as you very well know, um, so we have uh, you know 10 million articles that that we've secured from publishers. We've done the normalization to the to the JATS uh, tag set and XML. So admittedly, there are gaps in in that, right? As you talked about the uh, evolution of scholarly publishing with annotations and various things, but. But you know we're we're downstream of that. You know you're a technology 
service provider to publisher. So when the, the, the publishing paradigm changes, we'll all react to that. But up uh, Could you ask a question, please? Sorry. It had, not really had a question, more of a comment. But it, it hasn't yet, so, so we're just waiting yes. upon that, right? Yeah. No, no. Uh, first of all, archiving is, is one of the things where um, having multiple solutions is a good thing. <laughs> having multiple alternatives is always a good thing. I would not advocate that you only have one archiving solution because, you know, uh, actually hybridization brings strength. And that's a very, very good example. Um, however, as I said, all of the, you know, as a technologist, when I look at the way archiving is done today, I see faults with every, you know, in every solution. And as a technologist, I'm always inclined to create a new technology solution for it. Uh, and I believe that right now, the technology, it was not possible 20 years ago, and still not possible, it's not gonna be possible in 2018. I think this is something that still needs work. You're talking about 2019, two years, two to three years out, that we will be able to say, okay, we can actually, we have now perfect archiving. And it's important to be done. Uh, the reason that it's important to be done is that up till now, uh, I, th I don't think that any publisher went orphan. I don't think any journal went orphan. I'm not sure. I think they have been always being bought by some other publisher. But we don't know. I'm not sure that this is going to be happening in 10 years. So I think that you know, journals that go defunct will just go defunct. So that's what, I'm that's what I'm afraid. Thank you so much, Georgia. So thank you. Okay. Thank you.